for the oral history collections of the Fashion Institute of Technology and for the project of the history of FIT itself. This will be an interview with Bob Abagian. The date is January 19th, 1985, and the interviewer is Mildred Finger. Bob, just for the record, um, am I right that you were graduated in 1952 and that your major was design? And yes. that you spell your name A-B-A-J-I-A-N? That is correct. My okay. Friend. Then and would you, uh, uh, tell me, well, the first thing I'd love to know is at what age did you know that you wanted to become a designer? And then we'll go back and talk about your early story. My goodness. <laughs> at what age? Uh, I guess I must have been seven or eight years old. I know I was taken to see Snow White. And promptly upon coming home, I started to sketch clothes for costume. I didn't know they were called costume, but that was the first inkling. And by the time I was in my early teens, I knew I wanted clothing, but I thought it was theatrical design that I wanted. I loved uh, the magic of theater. I had built a miniature set. I would light it with Christmas lights. I designed hypothetical productions and did research to de and designed the costumes. I guess the drawing skills were always very easy for me. Can tell you, before we go any further, was your family in any way involved in Not any in of any business? shape, way or form. Where were you so born? When were you was, born? I'm a native New Yorker. I was born on 16th Street and 8th Avenue mm -hmm. in 1932. And what did your parents do? My parents, my uh, father had a grocery store. And early on in that neighborhood, and later on in the, as a matter of fact, not too far from here, on the East 67th Street. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very funny that after all these years, you kind of come back and live yes. in the neighborhood that I used to, when I used to go as a child to see him on Saturdays, I used to work in the grocery store delivering packages. It was just like four blocks away right. from here. Right, right, because we're at 160, 65th Street, yeah. So it's kind of funny. But there was no background except my mother, who always made her own clothes, and she either used or didn't use a pattern. And if she saw a style she liked, she seemed to have the gift of just coming home and taking a piece of fabric and cutting it this way and that way and making clothing for herself. And it fascinated the hell out of me. And I never knew how she had arrived at that, but she had never had any formal training in it. But she knew how to do it. And there was nothing she couldn't make. When my brother and I were you kids, just, the two, of just the two of us, my brother and I were kids, and we wanted costumes, a Superman costume or Batman costume. Today, of course, you can go into a store and find anything. We didn't have things like that. My mother made them for us. And I loved it. I remember my first cape and all of that kind of thing. I think I was Batman. Yeah. And so the sewing skills were around me but I didn't necessarily have them. Right, yeah. And but in terms of creativity you know, and the artistic approach, there was nobody in the family that had been artistic. It was just me. You know, and it was very difficult because they never understood what I was all about. But um, then I, of course, when decision time came to decide on what kind of high school I wanted, I knew I wanted design. And at that time, it was called the School of Industrial Art, which was a high school. And now it's called the High School of Art and Design. And they had, part of the curricul curriculum was to have fashion design. And that's where, where I Where is that school located? Today, it's located on 57th and 2nd Avenue. Mm -hmm. In those days, it was at 79, <coughs> between 3rd and 2nd. And which is kind of wonderful, because I think I spent all my afternoons at the Costume Institute which was a tiny, tiny wing at that time uh, at the uh, Metropolitan. New, a new wing, because originally, I believe it was in the, in the early 50s, it was on 51st or 52nd Street, and there was a lady named Paulette Weissman who kind of put this collection together, and then they kind of moved over there. But I lived at the museum. I also loved fine arts. I think I must have attended every gallery lecture that they ever gave, but the school would end at 3, and the gallery lecture started at 3.15. So there I was. And then, of course, you have to make a career decision as to whether it was theatrical design or fashion that I was going to go into. So you had to design, decide that in high school? Yes, because 
you have to decide the kind of training that you needed. Costume design for the theater required a lot more formal training. And then ultimately you had to uh, become a member of the, the Scenic Designers Guild in order to be able to get a job. And I had very good advice from people that I knew that knew about the industry. And they just said it was very tough. And I think it is tough even today. There's just such a handful of people that are in that part of it. And it takes years before you even get an opportunity to design for a production. And then it's got to be through the politics of somebody to even get into the, the guild. So I decided, well, I love fashion as well. And yet I really didn't know much about it. You know, we are, we're in an age of rapid media today. But in those days, you really didn't know that much about clothing except from newspapers and magazines. And having, there were no girls in our family, so it wasn't like I went on shopping trips to the stores to see clothing. Mm -hmm. So you lived in a rarefied world of French couture. And because you saw them in the magazines and you saw them in, on, in the newspapers, and you did read the magazine. And you, oh yes, papers. very much so. And so I made the decision that I had to find a school to go to, to, to develop the skills necessary to go into the industry. I knew very little about the industry. Uh, and then in investigating the schools, of course, FIT was one of the schools, as was Parsons. Uh, there were some other schools, but none of them seemed to have the stature of these two schools. Parsons was quite expensive, I think, at the time. I mean, in retrospect, it's really laughable. I think it was four hundred dollars, you know, a term. <laughs> but it was a lot of money in 1950. Yes. And FIT, of course, you could not pay to go to. They had to decide whether you had the talent and the dedication. And it was only by scholarship that you went at that time. Really? Yes. However, they also reviewed you every six months to decide whether you were serious enough to stay or to ask you to leave so that they could make room for somebody else. So you really had to be dedicated to what you did because it wasn't an easy curriculum. But I was fortunate to get into FIT. Was this after you had finished at the high school? Yes. And, when you, and I graduated in uh, <coughs> June of 50 and then in September of 1950 I started FIT. I didn't even know the first thing about how you go about making clothing, except I was already rather skilled at sketching. Mm -hmm. So I knew how to sketch an idea, but I didn't know whether it was makeable or not makeable, or how you even go about it. So I really had to learn from the very foundation of what it's all about. And FIT was terrific in that terms because they really took you back to square one. And, and they split you up into different priorities. You had the designing priority, which was sketching, which you had to continue to develop, and of course the actual skills of draping a pattern. It wasn't enough to, to sketch it. Now you have to see how and where you're going to go about making this happen. And you learned it by draping. You also learned how to put it together. And that was machine skills. And they had sewing class. And of course I'd never touched a needle in my life. And it's, um, it was rather frightening to sit down at the machine. And I guess they, they were used to it at that point. They knew what they were doing because they didn't even have thread in the machine. They just made us learn how to even feel the control of that machine because it was, I had never done this in my life. And these were power machines. These were not even home sewing machines. So you kind of had to go through all of this and uh, learn new skills. and. I had once heard that you will design only to the level of what you know can be made once you get past making great, you know, beautiful pictures. And in a sense, that's true. Uh, at least it's true for me. Uh, the mechanics of how something must be done always is subconsciously there when you're designing, so that you don't design things that are not makeable. And I think that's what was they, what they were hoping to accomplish. Therefore, they trained you in these very diverse ways, and it all came back to pure design. But the emphasis on the school was schizophrenic. Because while they said industry techniques, 
the stimulus was always French design. I mean, we all couldn't wait for the latest copy of L'Officiel to lunge at the pictures. And the stars were Balenciaga and Jacques Fat and Dior. And it really wasn't the real world. But that was really the magic. The American designer of such had a brief flurry, I guess, during the late 40s, early 40s, when Paris was cut off from the, the, the rest of the world. And so we developed American designers. And there were still some who were quite legitimate, especially in the sports area. You had Claire McCardle, who I think was peerless. And, but when you, when, once the French designers came back to being here, they were really the stars. Yeah, and so we, we used them as the guide constantly. There were, no, there were no stars in the American market as such. So the school emphasized that in terms of look to the, the French design and the French couture for inspiration, which is totally different today, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, tell me, Bob, at that time, this was 1950, mm -hmm. when you started there, how many students do you remember approximately, and what was the relation as the ratio okay. between men, men, okay. uh, men and women? Okay. Um, it was interesting. The I don't think they took more than a total of 100 students total, and that was split between the design class, apparel design, which is the largest segment, millinery design. Really? Still millinery. Millinery, and management, oh, textile design, which is very small, and uh, business management, and uh, I guess time motion study, all of the mechanical aspect. And I would say that the, the probably the biggest segment must have been, and my figures may be wrong, it may not add up right, but I would say that maybe it was 50 or 55 percent apparel design, 20% uh, management and the balance split between textile and millinery, which were very small. Of the men versus women ratio, management was 99% men. Millinery te and textiles was split. Textiles may be more 50-50, but there was a close ratio, I think, in the millinery as well. But in the apparel, because it was a largest block, I would say that maybe there were, if it was on a hundred percent, I would say that maybe it was twenty percent men. Really? So yeah. that far more women than men oh, in yes. the design area. Right. Very very uh, probably apparently then, in terms of the whole school population of a hundred, perhaps uh, two thirds were women and yes. one third men. Yes. Like yes. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Right. But. At that time, when you went to FIT, you could come from various backgrounds yeah, in terms right. of education. And a lot of the women that went to FIT came from the home economics sewing aspect. In fact, FIT was an outgrowth of the High School of Needle Trades. Right. And there were a lot of students who had needle trades as a background, and especially the women that went on to FIT. Whereas people like myself from a school like uh, Industrial Art, came from an art background that was there were three ways you could go there art background academic background or sewing background and i would say that the majority of women that went there came from the sewing background whether they came from uh, needle trades or other schools or junior richmond or any of the schools where they had home ec classes they were not necessarily design classes i think the only school that had design was the high school that i had gone to right so I would say, yes, you're right, that it was that percentage of women mm -hmm. the men. Um, how many, uh, well, what, you, you went for two years? It was a two-year two course, and when I graduated mm -hmm. in June of 1952, that was the first year that we kind of became legitimate. That was the year that we were given associate's degrees. Up until then, you just graduated. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at that time, it, and because of ha uh, the associate's degree program, the, the school had introduced academic subjects, uh, such as sociology, uh, English, and in English it was, it was slated to really learning reporting techniques or research techniques. I remember uh, having to do uh, 
pick a subject and do research on it and put together a book on it. And I picked history of costume, which was logical for me. And you had to learn the techniques of how you do footnotes and uh, how you uh, set up your information <coughs> properly. But uh, and also, of course, there was um, history of art. And uh, so they gave you some of the academic subjects in order, I think, to qualify for the associate's degree. It couldn't only be in the vocational end of it. It had to have these. Uh, well, that sounds as a, you know that makes a lot of sense because you, as a designer, design director, you have to make presentations, don't you? So yes. you really have to know. Oh, the uh, the skills were wonderful. Uh, I didn't think they were so wonderful at the time. I uh, you know it's like a lot of hard work. Uh, that. Yes. Well, you put in very long hours. Uh, the school developed um, work ethic for you that was that you had to get the job done. And it was very important to understand that if you stayed up 24 hours, you had to get the job done. And it really rubbed off on you later on in life. I remember in the early 50s, after I was out working, that there were times where uh, friends of mine would like to go out on the evening, and I'd say, well, I just can't. I have sketches that I must do. So it, you, it did give you the priorities. And you put in pretty intensive days, because even if you didn't want to sew, for instance, or didn't like sewing, which I detested, uh, nevertheless, you had to learn the techniques and you had garments that you had to make. And whether they were for the fashion show or for the class or whatever it was, these were projects that had to be done. And in looking back on it, I think the teachers were terrific for this reason. They didn't coddle you. Uh, I think teachers uh, tend today to coddle the students, uh, to uh, allow more, to be more permissive. Uh, you couldn't. Where was it and why hadn't you done it? And that reflected on how serious you were about your business. So it was a tough day, but it gave you terrific work ethics. Okay. Were, were, uh, can you remember whether you were, did your, instru your instructors have academic backgrounds plus the industry background, or, or why, how did it seem to you? I, I, I knew that they all had uh, industry background, because I think that was a prerequisite for teaching. In, in our area. So if somebody taught, was teaching you uh, uh, sketching, you had to they, they, right. with sketch. Exactly so. And the draping uh, teachers all had industry background because, in fact, some of them used to talk about when they were in the industry. Mm -hmm. But I was never really aware of the kind of companies or what they really did. Mm -hmm. um, time was so precious that you just never got into that part of it. Um, but they were, they were Technically, they were terrific, and uh, they made you learn. Did, did we, what building were you in at that point? I we see. shared two, two and a half floors of the High School of Needle Trade. So you were still there, I mean, the, the 227 West 27th Street had not yet Oh, no, up. it wasn't, I think it wasn't even a, a, a dream. Right, yeah. Yeah, it was right. the High School of Needle Trades, which also had been Dr. Ritter's uh, child, uh, and then FIT grew out of that, and I think it was the eighth and ninth floor and part of the seventh floor on the building on 24th Street. And so it was kind of strange, you're coming into sure. a building where you had all the high school students and there you were, you know, in, in a, in a uh, junior college. So physically we were all contained in one space. Do you have any small. kind of library there? Not really. Not really. No. But, um, in terms of research material, even at that age, oh. I already had started to develop a library of my own. I don't know, take a peek in my bedroom, you'll see there isn't any wall space left. Uh, in terms of uh, reference material. What kinds of reference material? Starting at that time, of course, with history of costume. Mm -hmm. And then through the years later on, I realized that textiles were very important uh, resource material for inspiration. So that was the other things that I acquired. But I also knew how to use a library, but uh, a library other than what I had and other than what was in the school, because I don't think they even had a library. Mm -hmm. uh, because have you been a good student in high school? I had been a wonderful student yeah. in high school. Uh, I wasn't considered a great student in FIT, I don't think, because they did put emphasis on sewing skills, and I detested sewing skills. Absolutely detested them. Uh, my draping was excellent. Uh, 
palimenting and draping. The sketching was, my sketching was quite good. But when it came to sewing, and if you were judged on the final garment, it was really a rough road for me to hoe. Because I really didn't enjoy mechanically making it. I enjoyed seeing it made, but have it mecha putting, putting it together myself was not what I was all about. Mm -hmm. So I guess that maybe it might have been just uh, my own perception, but I always felt that if, if they had taken a poll of the teachers uh, of who would be least likely to succeed, maybe I wouldn't be the least likely to succeed, <laughs> but I would be down pretty much yes. at the bottom I mean, this of that. Is not being oh, this no, is no. Really this is very, very right. much, yeah. very, very yeah. much the fact. That's interesting. Um, you had, of course, I think in your class you had several other people who went on to become designers in the industry, right? Yes, uh, but in all honesty, they disappeared so quickly that um, I can't today think of anyone that's in the industry that came from my class. Uh, the only one I can think of is somebody that was six months uh, earlier than I was mm -hmm. and whom I knew uh, even before then, uh, Ruth, uh, at that time it was Ruth Zweibach, so now it's uh, Ruth Norman. How do you spell her name, her maiden name? Uh, Z-W-I-F-A-C-H. Uh, I think her, um, Ruth Norman is her uh, professional name, right, and, right. and uh, so I knew Ruth, and Ruth had, is still in the market, right. but people didn't stay. You know, and so yeah, let's talk about it, that no. value because um, that's interesting. When you uh, um, we, we're now talking about a class which was graduated in '52, and I believe the first graduating class was in '46. Mm -hmm. So that you would have uh, there were several classes between you and the beginning. Um, but in those days, some people apparently went to the market but didn't stay in the market. Is that it was very rough to find a job. The reason was, today, for instance, if we're looking for young designers or, or new uh, talent, we will call the schools to see if they have either graduates, just grad newly graduating, or people with a couple of years' experience. And we're willing to take them on and train them uh, and develop talent. It just didn't exist in 1952. If you didn't have five years of experience, you could never get a job. Well, how can you have five years of experience if nobody will give you a job? And the breaking in the first year was probably the most crucial year for somebody who came out of school. The placement office could do just so much. And after that, it was just was not possible because the, the amount of jobs for new graduates was really minimal. Therefore, after the first year, if you couldn't get a job, you disappeared out of the market. I think we had discussed earlier, and I said to you that uh, there were always more women than men in class, but the men were the ones that were more visible in, in, in the industry because they had to earn a living. This was their chosen profession. Mm -hmm. Women at that time were not so career-minded and got married or went into other fields really didn't have the drive because it wasn't that necessary. Mm -hmm. um, so you got married instead. Mm -hmm. uh, men had no alternative. So while there was a smaller percentage of men that graduated, they were the ones that did stay in the market. And even then, it was very difficult. I remember uh, getting jobs and losing jobs rapidly because you lied to get the job. Mm -hmm. And of course, your, ta your abilities were not up to the job. So the first couple of years were terrible years because you knew no one that could get you an interview and you had to literally uh, beat the bushes to find a job. And of course what they paid you was a pittance. Now, as long as you're talking yeah. about that, should we talk about it from your own experience? I mean, what happened when you got out? And okay. Did? I had worked the last six months of the last term in school we had an, a, an, a, an internship, apprenticeship idea, and you worked for, I think, uh, half of the term or 10 weeks of the term, and the school helped get you a job. They helped you with an interview anyway. 
And I remember going to work for a sportswear company, Eileen Rickey in 1407 Broadway. R-I-C-K-E-Y. Right. Which was a junior sportswear company. I didn't even know what junior meant because it was the infancy of that industry at that time. But I learned them rather rapidly. And my, my position there was the designer was so overloaded with designing the line that she had no one to do the blouses for. She could never get to them. I inherited designing the blouses to go with the rest of the sportswear. And so I sketched ideas, showed them to her. She would select what she wanted. I would then drape it up, cut it, and the sample maker would put it together. That was my first, I think it was in five week increments. Mm -hmm. And that was my first. Uh, that was my second five-week uh, job. I remember the first one, which was, I call it a chamber of horrors because I really hated children's wear, and the only industry they got me into was children's wear. I was the assistant to the assistant pattern maker. And my function was to cut out the patterns that had already been graded. And I'll never forget it because, I, the yes, the company was a giant firm. It was called Susie Brooks. Uh -huh. And they were on 8th Avenue. And it's kind of traumatic, you know. I lived in the Bronx. I came down to school. And I lived in a very little rarefied world. And now I was plunged into uh, also working in the industry in this building on 8th Avenue, I think 8th Avenue, 38th Street, 528th Avenue. And there I was cutting out the patterns. I'll never forget the, the man who made markers in the cutting room came to me and said, <laughs> I'll never forget the words. We strive for excellence here. And I apparently had not cut exactly the pencil line of the graded pattern, so I was supposed to be more accurate. But then, of course, the, the, the irony of it was then you saw when they took your patterns to make the markers, the size of the pencil point that they used must have been like a quarter of an inch wide, you know. So it was kind of a contradiction. But I felt that I wasn't going to learn anything there because it was an industry I had no interest in. Mm -hmm. So, and that was the first internship, and then the second one was Eileen Ricky. And then when I got out, well, they sent you on a number of interviews, and after that, how many places could they find for you to go as a student of a school? And so, you look for ads in papers, you, you talk to other people, and I remember then getting a job on 36th Street in what I would now call a schlock shop that made skirts. The industry in those days was quite different than it is now. There's, everybody was a specialist. This one made skirts, that one made shirts, and somebody else made dressy blouses. Nobody made sportswear collections. You didn't make tops that went with bottoms. That happened later. Coordinates came out. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know, because I lived through the sportswear uh, growth, and I know when it happened. But that happened later. Uh, so this place made inexpensive skirts. And my design room was the corner of the cutting table in the cutting room. And I had a sample maker who really was the head forelady of a little miniature factory. So when she had time, she would make the samples up. So I would sketch out the ideas, cut the garments. I'm sorry, which yeah. firm was this now? This was a little firm called Eddie Lee Sportswear on 36th Street. This okay, was my this first, job first job after I was out of school. Right. And they paid me $35 a week. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you that $35 a week in 1952 was just as insignificant as it is today. You couldn't do anything with $35 a week. By the time I think they took taxes out, it was $28 a week. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it was a beginning. But you really worked as if you were making a hundred dollars a week. I mean, it, the, the work was the same. And I found that these were the jobs that I was getting, but I wasn't holding them very long. I had no idea what merchandise was all about. Because the interesting thing was, I had not been trained to even go into a store to look at clothing. Hmm. You went into a store to buy things for yourself, but you didn't go into shop the store. At best. FIT had taught us to go to the wit to the store and sketch the windows. But shop the stores, look at the product. <coughs> Everything was supposed to come out of your own head. 
And it did, and in a lot of cases, is that, is that why they didn't ask you to shop seals that had no? Clothes? They never that trained you that way. They, they had no, <clears throat> because the the emphasis was on French couture. The emphasis was on product and not on marketing. Exactly, too. there was no uh, tie back to product other than the very very expensive and very and very design oriented. While they made you sit at the sewing machine and learn how to sew. They weren't teaching you to design or open your eyes in, in any way. I said years later that if I could teach a course at FIT or any school that taught design, I would teach a course that did, wasn't specifically designed. It was specifically teaching you the world around you and all the influences, what these things are, to begin to make more sophisticated students, uh, to make them aware of the arts of uh, all the things that go on in the world that affect clothing. Uh, even the, the trade newspapers in those days, like Women's Wear Daily, were really very, very uh, limited publications and very, very uh, unsophisticated, so that you weren't exposed to this kind of thing. Go into the stores and shop for product. What did that mean? You know. So. It was, it was a very difficult time getting started. And of course, you went from job to job because you lost your job. Uh, they realized very shortly after you, they saw these creations that you had no idea what their business was all about. In other words, you went into a company and you didn't really know what they were, ma were making. You knew what you wanted. Right. But even if you knew that they wanted to make skirts, like Eddie Lee made corduroy skirts, I don't think I've ever seen a corduroy skirt. I mean, it's just, yeah, or paid attention to it. Because if you said corduroy to me, maybe it might have been a glamorous coat that Jacques Bath might have done. But I certainly had no idea what a corduroy skirt was about. You weren't taught to observe. Maybe that's all part of what this experience. But I just wish it had been, I was exposed to it earlier. It would have, it would have made you grow up earlier. So I did it the hard way. Uh, I, l I learned by being fired. I learned by knowing what was expected of me, but was lacking. And it didn't take too long to begin to understand what that was all about. So that by the following year, it took a year of getting kicked in the pants, and maybe everybody has to go through it. I don't know, maybe that comes with the territory. It took a year of getting kicked in the pants to learn that there were other things out there that affected your product, and that you had to be more sensitive what business was all about. And the other four other expression that comes to my mind now is that the fashion industry is a product, not an art form. And that's very important to understand. And that's what I had to begin to learn. I am still learning it 33 years later. But you think the art forms, I understood correctly, as you were saying before, the art forms are what you should be aware of. But you should not think but of fashion is not an art fashion form. Is an art. Because you have to you have to appeal to so many people, and you have to make real clothing. So the luxury of, of art form is perhaps maybe for the elite in a very small area of the couture, and even then I think that that is also disappearing. I think maybe the only person left today who practices that is somebody like Galanos who's his own person, his, has his own design point of view, and creates masterpieces. And uh, so, <clears throat> so I had to learn the business by walking into stores, seeing what product was all about. So I went from a lot of these little jobs, and the sportswear was one. I'm trying to remember some of the others. Uh, there weren't too many. Uh, that I can remember, but they're all very much, oh, uh, there was another one on 36th Street, Sudbury Originals. Sunbury. Sudbury. Sudbury. And I asked the owner once why the name, and he said that when he was in the service during the war, he was stationed in a town in England called Sudbury, ergo <laughs> the name. This too was a small sportswear company, but it was somehow that year later, I already had gained the knowledge of how to put things together. But it was the first place 
where I ever looked at a textile line. A salesman came up and showed you a line. I never knew how that worked because usually on these other companies, the boss said, there's the fabric, make styles. So that was the beginning of knowing that salesmen came up from print houses, that we did printed skirts in those days. And we also made blouses to go with it. This was the first coordinating of sportswear. And it was, I mean, it was like the revelation from on high. You actually saw fabrics. And all these salesmen all had different things in their little bags. And that was the first exposure to it. And that job, I stayed at for about nine, ten months, and then got fired. <laughs> uh, they had hired a pattern maker who also was a stylist. And that, in those days, that was quite prevalent in the market, in right. merchandise of that price level. You know? And so you would buy a garment here or see a garment there, and that's how they work. So from there, I kicked around not working for about six months. And I remember this, that, that particular time because right after that is when I think my career began to be serious. I went to work for a skirt company at the time, and a gentleman who was a true entrepreneur, uh, the company was called Sport Tempos in 1954, oh, yeah. and the gentleman mm -hmm. was Jack Baker, mm -hmm. and he had the ability to take the most commonplace thing and romance it. And we made skirts. Not only did we make skirts, but we were so limited, we made straight skirts. This was the period That was of, the classification. That's right, straight, straight skirt. skirt. And with menswear detailing, the shining star in the industry at that time was Evan Picone, and their wool flannel skirt, for instance, sold for eight seventy five wholesale, which was a $16 retail. And we sold ours for six seventy five, which was a $12 retail. And for that price, we gave 100% wool flannel, slim skirt, seat line, which Jack Baker called the inner secret. Well, these were all very slim, pegged skirts, and you had to seat line them, otherwise they would be they would get sprung. And they were I love to get them because we talk about long skirts, but they were 30 inches long and pegged, and if we didn't make pleats at the bottom, you could never move in them. But he marketed a highly successful product. He filled the need, he knew how to sell it. And it was my first exposure to somebody who was more professional in his approach to what his company was all about. And I worked for him for about two years and then went to work for another company. He was in 1372. And in those days, building Broadway. Broadway. And in those days, buildings were also uh, classifications. In 1372, you had skirt makers of a particular price level. So you had uh, people like the, well, the Rust Togs today were in that building. There were skirt makers, Jack Baker Sport Tempos, Anne Marie Sportswear, uh, Philip Gurry, and these were all people who made skirts. That was the whole product. And so I went to work for the competition there. And during that period, which I think was Anne Marie Sportswear, in fact, the children of the owner are now in the industry. They're the Benson brothers. Ah, yes. And these were all Morris Benson was a principal in Anne Marie, and then was Jack and Irving Benson were his sons. And I remember them vividly coming up to see their father at that time. And in fact, I think Morris Benson is still alive. I believe How he is. How do you A-N-N dash M-A-R-I-E. And uh, Morris Benson, I think, is retired and still alive in Florida. And uh, so uh, I worked for them for a while, and I began to meet people in the industry, and that was how the magic started. I met people at the textile houses, and one of the ways to get jobs was you would let your textile salesman know if you wanted, you were unhappy and you wanted to leave. That's who you told. And somehow that was the grapevine, and he would talk to the boss of so and so and say, "I have somebody that's terrific for you, etc." That's how it worked. Mm -hmm. And I met a lady who I would probably say was the the godmother to, to to half of the industry, although a lot of people perhaps would not admit it today. She was dynamite. She was the fashion director of a textile company called Volker Textiles, and her name was Elaine Kramer. 
And she came from the public relations world where she had worked for Mr. K Kalish, who owned Dan Bogarty and Rappi and people like that. She knew everybody in the market. And, you know, they, they were a moderate priced textile house, but she would pick up the phone and call Ann Klein and she'd get Ann to use their fabrics. And I mean, she had the ability to, to create magic with a textile, but she also knew everybody. And by meeting her, I guess she liked me. It was the break that you need. You need, somebody said, you need a rabbi at the top. You need somebody who can open doors for you. Maybe it's different today, but I don't think so. But it was, in those days, very definitely the only way you could get an opportunity to, to go somewhere else. And so from there, I went to, through her, I had an interview with a large blouse company called uh, Max Shaw Classics. And they did nothing Max Shaw. Max Shaw. Max. Max Shaw was the name, so this became M A C Shaw. And they were a fairly big company in the blouse business. I wanted to go into sportswear because the shining star, the new infant that was rapidly making strides, was sportswear. And sportswear that was now having mates that matched. Very important. It was the blouse that went with the skirt. In fact. Just to go back to 1954 through 56, what started to happen with Sport Tempo's skirts was that we died to match somebody else's sweaters. Now, we either did it legitimately, that is, we had a tie-in with Garland and we would die to their colors, or we did it surreptitiously, when the buyer would bring us snips of their colors and we would dye our wool flannels or our linens to match uh, Bernard Altman's sweaters. Now, Bernard Altman <coughs> certainly wasn't packaged with our product, but that's what we used to do. That was the beginning of things made to go together. So by, by 1956 and 57, when I went to work for Max Shaw, already the idea of packaging began. And I think there was a company in the industry called Majestic Sports yes, well, yes, that began well. to put things together in the late 50s. Nessie got right, right. Kleinman. Right. And that was when the yeah. first coordinated sports fair meeting took off in its great scope. So here I was at Maxwell Classics doing sports fair. I'm sorry, is Maxwell one word or two? It, it's two words, okay. and because his name was Max Shaw, yeah. but the company became Mac, M-A-C, capital S-H-O-R-E. The company no longer mm -hmm. exists, I think, uh, 10 years ago it went out of business. Um, but from there, I started to make the ascent into the junior sportswear business. Again, through, the, uh, through this lady, uh, a very new junior sportswear company had started doing better junior sportswear called Country Set, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was the, the principles were people that came out of a previous company out of St. Louis called Joe Collins. This is how companies developed in those days. And I went to work for them. And by this time, of course, my salary was moving upward. Now, I was, now this is 1959. My salary was now $275 a week. Oh, I have to tell you, my big plunge from my $35 a week was when I went to work at Sport Tempos and when Jack Baker asked me what I wanted, I said, I, I, I want $100 a week and he didn't quibble with it. And of course, I have always said to my friends, if I ever make $100 a week, we're all going out to dinner. And they, and they held me to it. <laughs> so I was making $275 a week at Country Set. But it was tremendously, tremendously important for me having that job <coughs> because it was better junior design-oriented company. It was the first time that you were called upon to really design. Up until then, you designed within a framework, slim skirts or, or, or uh, blouses or blouse to go with the skirt kept relatively simple. But here, for the first time, you had to have concepts and ideas and end use of the merchandise you were going to design. And you had to be original but market 
and it was tremendous. The exposure to fabric that I had never been allowed to use before, and the desire for unique, beautiful merchandise was the first place that I ever had that opportunity. And it was fantastic for me. I, I stayed there several years, two years, and then I was weaned away to my very first, what I call, design director type job, working for a Dallas company, <coughs> Lord of Dallas, which is still in business, as the fashion director for the company, with input into all of the various departments. They did dresses, suits, as well as sportswear. So you had several designers right. working there. And it was the first time that I was ever going to direct design, right. exactly. which was a little difficult because I was younger than the people I was going to direct. I also still lived in New York, but I commuted to Dallas. I lived two weeks of each month in Dallas they two weeks. They kept their room down there? Yes. It was a huge facility, and I had to be down there. And ultimately, I had a small design facility up here because in addition to the supervision of these other designers, I also wanted to continue to create part of the product in the sportswear. They had a, a, a sales room up here, was that? They had no sure. sales. They had no sales. They only had to buy an office that they used to use to buy fabrics. I see, and so that was where you said. So as, a, as an adjunct to that mm -hmm. office, we created a design studio. Mm -hmm. And that's where I went. Right. Um, now I'm so how long did you stay with Lord? I stayed with them a year and a half. I had a five-year contract. It was the first time I ever worked with a contract. But I couldn't take the travel. It was nightmarish. And we parted very amiably. And they're still friends of mine to this day. And then I wanted to come back into the market. But you know, the funny thing that happens, even with this commuting schedule, of a year and a half away from the market, was like you, people didn't know you. Because you didn't have a New York base in terms of a showroom. So it was like almost starting all over again, but by then, because I had a network of friends, I went to work for a junior sportswear company through, the door was opened for me by the people at Seventeen Magazine, whom I had gotten to work with very closely, because I had been at Country Set, and we were very, very much an editorial resource for Seventeen Magazine. Mm -hmm. So through uh, Ellen Sands at Seventeen Magazine, I came up to see people at a company called Kelly's Health, which was a junior sports company right. in the 1960s.